Rob Shen, pleasure. Pleasure yeah. to have you in the studio, mate. Absolute Thanks so much. pleasure. Glad we can make it happen. Um, what were you asking me? What? <laughs> Two questions. Will Carlin, no way out. Yeah. Uh, well, Will Carlin got on a podcast. Uh, how did that happen? Well, he wasn't on the HR podcast. Was he not? No, he was on Leading Minds. Ah, uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I did as a separate series. Yeah. But now I, I, I'm re-releasing those into HR yeah. as HR's Leading Minds. So they're all, all those 10, in, well, there's two less now because the people I interviewed have moved on for positions. It's not yeah. appropriate to re-release it because yeah. in the podcast we talk about their positions as it, uh, well, they're not there anymore. Yeah. Anyway, uh, long story short, Will Carlin, you know James Degan? No, no, James no. James Deegan, 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 MC. So he's he's ex. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Two two yeah, yeah. RSM. Yeah. Uh, he introduced me to Will. Right. And then Will got on, came on the leading minds. Yeah. And uh, in answer to your question, is he part of the Fubars? Forces Barbarians? No, he's not. Yeah. But he's done a Q and A for us. Yeah. He he will be a member. Right. <laughs> Doesn't mean like he's eligible to play as well because yeah. he's ex military. Yeah. So he will be. Uh, that's on, that, that answers that one. And then No Way Out, the book. Yeah, brilliantly written. Yeah. Brilliantly written. I, 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 I don't, um, I, as I was saying just now, I, I, I don't, I can't, I can't, I struggle to read, I don't read books about Afghan. Yeah. Um, I, I just find it difficult to read for a multitude of reasons. And Max Arthur, who sadly now passed away, who's uh, uh, an author, who was an author himself, like a military historian, if you will, um, he he rang me and said, oh, "Have you read uh, Have you read uh, Jowett's book? No way out." I said, "No, nah, mate, I can't. I can't. I don't really read that kind of stuff. I can't read it." But I'm afraid of. Well, I, do you know one of the things I'm afraid of with with reading those kind of books? I want as reading something that's inaccurate, and I go, "That's bollocks." Yeah, I know it's bollocks. I was there. I don't want to. I don't want to read that because then I know that's a bullshit. That's a bullshit statement that's out there in the public domain. I don't want yeah. that. Anyway, he said, oh, I think you should I think you should give us some time and read it. I was like, well, okay, if Max Arthur's telling me this, then I should have a read. And I bought the book. I already had the book, actually, because I, I went to the book launch. I already had the book, and I started reading it. Yeah. And I did about three quarters of it in one night. I couldn't put it down. Yeah. I couldn't put it down. Brilliant, brilliant book. Um, brilliant book. Some inaccuracies, mind. Yeah, I found <laughs> it. Was about, on the whole, it was really good. It took about eight years, because I was in Helmand in 2008 in Muscala, and um, obviously not as bad as when you were there. But um, it took me about eight years before I picked up the book. And there was Sam Riley, I think, wrote one, like on behalf of the brigade, which was obviously 16 air assault at the time. But then I think um, Russ Lewis's book, Company Commander, came out. And that's a really good book, particularly from a leadership point of view. And um, and that's the one that started me off. But it was I haven't seen reason. that one. Company Commander. I've yeah, not, why really have I not good. seen that one? It's really good. As a, as um, When you went to Sandhurst as an officer, you were told to read, um, I think it was 45 platoon or 14 platoon, I forget it, by Sidney Jarrow. I probably got it wrong. Um, and to me, Rusty's book was like the next level up for a company commander. His Will you just pull that mic up a bit? Yeah. His was the next level up, lo level up as, a, as a company commander. And um, yeah, it was really good. But I don't think many people have latched onto it as a source of a leadership book. No, I might have to have a look at that. Yeah. Have you ever read a book called The 13th Valley? No. Oh, the greatest military book you'll ever read. Well, it's part fact, part fiction, right? It's by a guy called John Del Vecchio. Right. Uh, John Del Vecchio was a, he was a combat correspondent in Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. He went out six or seven times. Um, I think he may have been ex-military himself, right? Uh, but either way, he went out six or seven times across the, the Vietnam campaign. Yeah. And the book is, the story of the book, the overarching sort of plot is that it follows the company of 101st Airborne. No, a battalion. 101st Airborne called oh, the five, the five of Jew, 502nd Battalion or something like that, right? Uh, and they they get intelligence that there's a an NVA headquarters in this valley called the Ketalao Valley. Mm -hmm. And the Ketalao Valley is the 13th valley along in a, in a, in a, in a line of valleys that are next to each other, yeah. the 13th valley. And so they put in a battalion up to go a, 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 a heli assault to go and secure the high ground around it, the valley high ground around it, and with the companies. And then uh, one of the infantry companies will go onto the valley floor, the jungle floor, uh -huh. and sweep through to try and find this NVA HQ. The way the book starts out 
is each chapter, the first four, maybe three or four chapters, is introducing the main characters, the protagonists. You know, you've got your stereotypical new bloke, um, the cherry as he's known, the, the Joe bag, right? Yeah. Until he just rocked up, thinks he's going to be a signaller, ends up like an infantry platoon with uh, with 101st. Um, you've got the the long and the tooth veteran platoon sergeant. You've got the educated uh, platoon commander, black guy in the book. Uh, that's what it starts out. But the insight it gives into the kind of people that were on the ground in Vietnam. You know, you, you stereotype it, don't you? With yeah. um, uh, everyone was, you know, everyone was like, like the. We look at it now. When you think of a Vietnam veteran, what do you think of? Um, uh, uh, you know, an elderly white dude, yeah. who's who's uh, who, you know who's a flipping right wing, some kind of white wing guy, which wasn't the case. Mo- most of the, I think, if I remember correctly, most of the people that fought in the Vietnam War who went, they were like these are college college graduates. Yeah. They weren't like high school dropouts. You know, what yeah. I mean? they were educated people. Um, it's, anyway, it's a, so the sub plots in the book, the sub the little stories of the little contacts that happen, conversations that go on. Um, all these little bits that that come together to make to form the overarching plot. All those little bits are true things that happened to different units that John Del Vecchio was involved with yeah. on his six or seven campaigns. So all his real life experiences that he saw and was involved with over his time as a combat correspondent, they're in there. So the nitty gritty detail of the 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 the, the, the story of the book they're real things that happened mm-hmm. not to 101st airborne because he was attached to a lot of different units but yeah. for the book he brings them all together they all happen to the same unit it's unbelievable it's yeah. incredible i mean it's like it's this thick mind it's a big old book <laughs> yeah i struggle with that <laughs> we, with this you won't because yeah. it's so engaging it's so engaging i, I mean I, i've you, you you can't buy it in the uk you have to get it on, on amazon they send it over from the us you can, it's not for sale in the uk it hasn't been for i don't know how long um but I get, but the overarching plot is fucking brilliant as well. Yeah. I mean, the the culmination of the book is incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. Like they they're going through the jungle floor. I don't want to spoil it. They're going through the jungle floor and uh, sorry, patrolling through you know bumps here, bumps there, and things start happening. And like this isn't normal. Like what we're seeing here is not. This is weird. This isn't. Uh, uh, rem- this isn't uh, indicative of a. NVA HQ element. This is something else. Like they would, they, there's one thing, there's one bit, and there's a, this section patrolling through, where the, the section commander of this particular section, he yeah. would always go lead man, yeah. and he would carry the, uh, oh, what, the M40, is it? What's their GPMG equivalent? M40? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He would carry that and go point man. And uh, they, he, come, he, he pushes through the, the, uh, the jungle, and he comes into this clearing, and it's like a bam, it's like as wide as a motorway. Oh, not my way. Yeah. Wide enough to get a four tonner, for example, down there. The floor is laid with bamboo, so it's drivable by a truck, for example. Yeah. They've cut all the trees down, so they, can get, so they laid this basically motorway in the, in the jungle. But they've woven the canopy over. They've woven the trees together at the top, right, so you to can't me, yeah. spot this motorway from the sky. It's like unbelievable. Wow. All little things like that, and you get to the end. It's, it's, it's not an MVA HQ. They're actually in the middle of an MVA. Battalion. Yeah. So you've got a company of 101st, and they find themselves in the middle of this NBA M- battalion, going, "Oh fuck!" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. 13th Valley, John Del Vecchio. Anyway, yeah. man, we've gone off on a right tangent. Yeah, I've yeah, gone yeah, on a yeah. right tangent. Yeah. I was going <laughs> to start saying the last book I read was um, was actually the CEO of Two Parrot in Arnhem. I forget that he became a general. I can't remember his name because my memory's so bad now. But he's called The Jump Too Far, and it's a really good book. But it's really interesting to read it from the perspective of someone in the 40s and their attitude it's like we lost we lost john and fred it was a bad day end of story move on to the next bit and it was like <laughs> stiff upper lip but it was really quite interesting because obviously i think he you know, he got made taken prisoner as well but it was a good book recommend it particularly for yourself um from uh, from the parachute reg it's really interesting do you think that i think that attitude was the same in afghan i think at times and iraq at times we're, we're, we're um Loss of life, a loss of people due to serious injury was uh, yeah. just ma- just a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, certain tours, certain units, uh, peculiar way of life. You yeah. Know. Um, weird one to uh, weird one to get a grip on after yeah. the fact when you come back. Yeah. Um, especially what's going on now. 
Yeah. Got an opinion yeah. on that? <laughs> yeah, I have. I, well, yeah. I mean, um, I've got to be careful because obviously I'm, I'm, a, I'm a civil servant, so I've got to be careful how I, how I cage things. But, yeah, I think it's difficult. I think if you look at any conflict when it's over or when it's moved on, then think the country's not necessarily going to be the same. I'm sure if you looked at World War II or certain countries, it was going to be like, crikey, has that happened? But, you know, Afghanistan is a gathering of tribes. That's what their name means. And it, it's always going to be a hotbed of conflict. It always is. And what was it? It was described as a 13th century country to country of mobile phones. I remember when we when we when we deployed there first time. Described as it was a 13th okay. century country with mobile phones, which like is that. appalling to the country because that's that's not fair on the people there. But when you think about it and the problems there, but I also think the stuff that's in the news is going to have some effect on some people who serve there at the moment because they'll think, oh, it was a waste and stuff like that. But we had a job to do, or the military had a job to do. And I think, yeah, we did it. Um, what was the job? Oh, crikey, now you're getting into it. Well, I'm going to have to go back to my memory, uh, back into the memory. I mean, originally it wasn't about, it wasn't about um, drugs or anything like that. It was actually about um, eradicating the, the Taliban, wasn't it? Because we went there post 9-11. And it was about getting into Al-Qaeda and finding them. But then it diverted, it, 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 the, the, the mission diverted and it started to become about drugs and things along those lines and, and protecting the UK from drugs that might be coming in. So, yeah, you have to be, you have to be quick to watch that subtle change in direction. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think that got diluted along the line. And, but I actually think it was a country where we could have had an effect or we, can, we did have an effect. Yeah. Definitely, had, we definitely had an effect. You know, um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm you know, me asking those questions. I'm not trying to, I'm trying, I'm not trying to cut you out. No, 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 I, no, I, no. I, you know, I mentioned you earlier. I had, a, I had my Zoom monthly Zoom call last night with my patron, my HR patrons, and um, normally it's a back and forth. We have a conversation. I get feedback from them on recent guests and just, just in general, with a chat. Uh, we had Dr. Ross Moy on as a, as I, I also get previous podcast guests on so it's a private zoom call yeah. with my patrons and they get to talk to previous guests for example ross moy came on um gave us his time really kind of him um but because of what's going on the conversation basically was that the whole thing was about afghan you know yeah. and um i'm trying to form i'm trying to form my opinions on it uh i almost don't want to yeah. you know um because i'm afraid of what i'll I'll, my opinion will be, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, it, because it's v you want to, you want to, what you don't want to do is invalidate the sacrifices that were made and the no. impact and the no. negative impact it had. Yeah. As in it being the twenty years. Yeah. You don't want to invalidate that, but there's a possibility that that impact is invalid. Yeah. And I, d I don't almost don't want to discover that. But I need to form an opinion. I have to. I think for, for sanity's sake, it's just, just not. It, I mean, it's really raw to me at the moment. So, like within 24 hours, raw. I can't believe what's gone on. I can't. Yeah. You know, for for people who are listening or watching, you know, the time we're sitting here now, Rob. Yeah. Uh, what well, five five provincial capitals have gone. Lashley yeah. has gone. Kandahar has gone. Kandahar, yeah. Um, Kabul is on the brink. Uh, two para and a bunch of U.S. Marines on the way to, if not already there yeah, already, to do Kabul the, now yeah. to do the extraction. So. Um, I, I think watching the news and seeing what I suppose with Taliban um, on the news, uh, and I know it sounds very bad, but because I dealt a lot with the civilians because I was a, a CIMIC operator, so civil military co cooperation. So every time a civilian turned up at the gate, it was CIMIC, and it's sort of like, have you tried talking to them? Um, no, that's your job, <laughs> but you can talk to them as well. Um, and um, But they, that arrogance of, of, of certain Afghan males... It, it, you could feel it sort of like welling up inside you again, like going, yeah, crikey, this bloke hasn't really thought about it, has he? And it was that bit. That sorry, the arrogance of what? Sorry. I, when I dealt with, this is, I've never really spoke, talked about this, but when I dealt with certain Afghan males, there was an arrogance there about them. Like, well, I'm right, sort of thing. And, and you know, I'm not saying I'm right, but it was like, actually, that's not, that's, that's not quite correct because, like, it... <sighs> For example, the arrogance that all, all, all women should wear burqas and women can't go to school and things like that. And it's difficult because you're not trying to put Hampshire into Helmand. 
but it was just that little bit that it used to used to spark a thing in me when I spelt, spoke to them, and I'd have to repress that because my job isn't to, wasn't to have an opinion. My job was to aid the local community to get where they were meant to be, um, doing hearts and even though I hate the word hearts and minds too effective, um, but you it was just you that hate it. I, I, I hate the word hearts and minds. Really? Yeah. What yeah. should it be? Well, I, hearts and minds goes back to Vietnam and what what people were doing in Vietnam, and we were we, we weren't necessarily doing that. And what we're trying to do is influence, and influence is about creating. If we want to go into the depth of it, it's create about creating a behavioural and attitudinal change. So you can change someone's behaviour quite quickly, but it's changing people's attitudes, which takes longer. So you can change behaviour, like saying, "Don't touch that cup." sort of thing and, and the person hopefully won't touch that cup and that's a behavioral change but then if you start talking about attitudinal change that comes from starting that behavioral change and moving on so it's all about if you go back into the depth of it crikey i haven't really talked about this ever for it but if you go back in the depth of it <laughs> go in there now yeah 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 <laughs> crikey what are you doing to me um <laughs> it's going to be like a therapy session um like yes, yes doctor i feel much better now thank you doctor <laughs> Dr. Hughes here. Um, but then you, but then, but the, um, you, right, so, everyone, obviously, when, you, when you're in the military and you're dealing with influence, a lot of the time you're having to deal with the fighting, you're working with the fighting units because they're the people dealing with the locals. And, and, and so there's nothing wrong with fighting units whatsoever. They're the, they're the makeup of the military. But when you're dealing with people which are used to firing rounds and having an instant effect by firing a bullet, or, or firing, firing a munition, it has an instant effect. You know, you will neutralise the enemy. You're going to start stereotyping me. No, 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 not at all, not at all, not at all, not at all. And um, you, and so, therefore, when you send a message out, it's not going to have an instant effect. And that's what influences. It's about sending messages out. So your message is effectively that bullet. And so, where the problem starts is you might speak to certain in my p opinion, you speak to certain commanding officers and they'd struggle to understand that if you've been messaging something on a radio programme, that you're not going to see that effect immediately. And so what the message does is the message creates a thought in someone's head and then that thought becomes a repeated thought because the message is being repeated and that repeated thought then leads to a an action and a repeated action leads to a behaviour and a repeated behaviour leads to a change in attitude. And so that mess what, what you're trying to do with the influence side, certainly in my my personal, with, with what I was doing personally in Afghanistan and all the, well, the area I was working in, we were trying to create a change that would go over months, years, whatever. And I actually think from the time that I went from 2008 to 2011, 12, you could see that change have taken place. And actually, and, and as a military as a whole, I think we were having a good effect. And, it, and it, I, I seriously think... We're in Afghan. Yeah, I think the, I think the commanders thought it was something that you could have a bet they could have a better effect at than they probably did in Iraq. Um, it's it's strange, right? So so yeah. I, I'm actually a military psychological operations planner. Believe it or not. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So he did 15 yeah, psyops. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. I don't talk about it. So it's like a weird qualification. Well, that's like, yeah, it's just psyops. Yeah, and then all all the uh, yeah. all the lunatics will come out and start commenting. But yeah, so I understand what you're saying. I completely understand. And the CEOs and the OCs, they don't understand the, it takes time to enact that kind of change of morons, yeah. right? And, and I'd say there's very few of those guys. Yeah. But, so I used to be, I used to say, I've said it repeatedly on the podcast, I said it in interviews and stuff when I'm talking to people about Afghan. Uh, it's like, look, you, can, you know, 10, 20 years isn't enough. It takes 40, 50, 60 yeah. years to yeah. enact the change on, uh, to enact the kind of cultural change that we're trying to achieve. I was thinking that until yesterday on an epiphany moment. All right, okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> on the patron call, and I put two and two together and got four. The two and two was what's going on in Afghan now, and that was one number two. And the other number two was a book I was given by um, a mate called Tony Shannon. He's a patron, and he's also been a guest on the podcast. Tony's ex free me, actually. He's ex free yeah. me, Captain. You, oh, you get, oh, no, he's away this weekend. Do you want me him? But he gave me a book called Brushfire Wars. And it is written by a British general. It was written in the 90s. And it is a book, each chapter, really good reading. Each chapter is about the, about the small conflicts that the British were involved with from the end of the Second World War to the 90s. Mm -hmm. Malaya, Kenya. You know, Falcons isn't in there because it wasn't a small conflict, right? So Malaya, Kenya, uh, oh God, what else is in there? Palestine. Yeah. 
really good. I'm learning loads, okay? And But one of the interesting things in there is how flipping effective we were at counterinsurgency. Man, we were good. Yeah, Malaya, yeah. Kenya, unbelievably good. Unbelievably good. Yeah. They could turn a culture around, in act change around, in years, less than five years, two or three years in some cases, completely turn it on, on its head. Why has it taken, why did it take 20 years in Afghan and we still didn't achieve the aim? Now, there it's different, right? Obviously, yeah. you've got a massive cultural difference. You've got the size of the place. You've got all kinds of stuff. But still, w w now what I think is, man, we could have achieved a lot more. Yeah. Why didn't we? Yeah. Mission creep is one answer. That is one answer. You're absolutely right. The mission changed from operation to operation, from Herrick flipping one to Herrick two, yeah. to Herrick four to Herrick five. Yeah. They, they cha it changed each time. And the telling sign as well is going back to the perception of the blokes on the ground of what they're trying to do and how they, they should be doing it. I can't repeat. I, I've got no idea. If you ask me now, so I did Herrick four, Herrick eight, and Herrick 13, right? Mm -hmm. If you ask me now, well, what was your mission on each one of those? What was the overarch? What were you trying to achieve in the operation? On Herrick 4, what are you trying to achieve in Herrick 8? What are you trying to achieve in Herrick 13? I can't tell you. Yeah. I, I, I can't tell you. I should know verbatim. Every single person should know verbatim when they go on an operation, be it Herrick or be it any, any other place. They yeah. should know verbatim what that unit's mission is. Yeah. And if you know it verbatim, you should recall it. I can't recall any of those. No. I could broadly say it, like Herrick 4, for example, was to secure the area, minimize, minimize Taliban uh, interference so we could set the scene so that on the Herrick 5, Herrick 6, Herrick 7 come in and start re reconstructing stuff that needed reconstructing, rebuilding the schools, yeah. enabling positive change in the culture that the Taliban reduced. Herrick 8 was, well, I was doing strike ops out of Kandahar on, on Herrick 8, it's different for me, but Herrick 8 was, like you said, moved more towards the, um, the drug side. Yeah. Herrick 13 was... Fuck knows. <laughs> Fuck no. I don't know. Well, I, I, don't on, know. I, I should know. Yeah. I should know. You know. Um, well, I was um, S2 influence on a Herrick. Um, Sorry for the swearing. On uh, 14 <laughs> and 15. Um, so that was three commander and then 20 brigade. And it was, it was, yeah, it was quite an experience. But um, yeah, the first, the, the first tour I said people were trying to kill me with bullets. And the second tour I said my own side were trying to kill me with emails. Um, <laughs> but. And, and actually, I, I, I hated the second tour purely because it was just too, too. Um, off. I mean, they, they reckon there was about a terabyte of information going around that headquarters at any time. Oh my god! And you just like it's 150. What year was this? This was um, 11, 12. That's an achievement back then. Yeah. Two years ago. That's <laughs> yeah. a lot of information. Though. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I see what you said. I think I think one of the problems, personally, I think one of the problems is we. I mean, I, I'm not a clever bloke. I'm not a strategist, but I think the military tried to reinvent itself too much. And if you look at the stuff, like you mentioned about insurgency, if you look at General Kitson's stuff from Malaya, and I, I, I had the luxury of being at a Kitson lecture. Kitson's the one who wrote the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Have you seen the book? Uh, I, I, I probably know the title. I can't remember. I'm not that clever. But, but then if you, and, and if you look at that, then those principles still stand to a certain extent. Attitudes have changed. You know, we, we don't go and shoot the, the main protagonist, etc. But then also... If you then take Rupert Smith's book, Utility of Force, which is over 20, about 20 years old now, yeah. if you take that book, which a lot of people forget about, um, then you end up... If you take the book of, of, of Rupert Smith that a lot of people forget about, the principles still stand, but people are forgetting it because it's a book that's 20 years old, so what relevance will it have? And actually, it's still there. Rupert Smith stuff that he wrote about in Utility of Force is still around today. Is that the book, is it? Yeah, Kitson didn't write the book. So I just, it's uh, Michael, Michael Dewar. Michael There's probably thousands of people camera, yeah. listening going, who wrote... Oh, um, yeah. Brush, Brush Fire Wars. Brilliant book. There's probably thousands of people going and going, come on, you must remember what Kitson's book was on Insurgency, but I can't for the life of me. <laughs> um, right, let's so get it back on track. Sorry. sorry. No, that's no, fine. My fault. Yeah. Flipping heck. Taliban's fault. Not my fault. Um... Nobody ever talked to me about that sort of thing. You yeah. sent me some articles that you'd written uh, for <laughs> as background before the podcast. Mate, the one the one entitled... Was it The Telegraph? The one entitled... Oh, no, no. It's just a LinkedIn article. That oh, pushed. one entitled... Um, suicide was... Why suicide was an option. Yeah. Very good. Very, very good. Thanks. Talk to me about that. Why was... So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so a bit about myself. I was, I was a Remy officer. I spent 
25 years in uniform, four years in the reserves, officer training corps, then I transferred to the Gunners because I didn't like being in officer training corps, then joined the Remi and so on. And then uh, I spent about half my life in it, it doing influence stuff, so information operations, CIMIC, media, that sort of thing. Um, well, yeah, over half my career. And I ended my career as a, an advisor within the research and development world in the M MOD and then got medically discharged. And I was medically discharged um, in 2016 uh, for recurrent depression and PTSD. Um, the PTSD, I don't think, was an issue. I thought, I thought, you know, personally, I thought, oh, they're just putting that on there. But then I found out later on, yeah, there was a few more issues there which which occurred in later life, which I can go into. But um, so the depression, I'd ha basically had depression since the year 2000, and I'd kept it quiet. Um, not kept it quiet. I'd sought medical help. But there was at least five or six times during my entire career where I had to go and see a psychiatrist. And it was either a psychiatrist just for a one-off or a two, two appointments just to keep me on the straight and narrow. Uh, and then, or it was like serious. And the last time I saw a psychiatrist in the military was 2012, coming back from Afghanistan the second time, about three, four months down the line, and just going, I don't feel right. And because of my history, I got triaged and got sent stri straight to DCMH. How did you know you were depressed? How did I know? Um, th right, the, fir <laughs> the first time I didn't know I was depressed. It sounds really odd, but luckily I went to an MO and the MO knew me from my very first posting. And um, and so he, he knew of me because we were in the mess together sort of thing. Um, and we weren't best mates, but he knew of me. He, he knew I was a trier. Um, and um, I went to him and said, I just haven't been able to get all this. I, I've had this cold for like six months. I haven't been able to get all of it, rid of it. And he, he, he started talking to me and he realized that I was just burnt out. And I'd taken over a workshop in the, in the Remi as a, as a captain. Your LED, your light aid detachment, is, 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 a, is a, a command appointment, which is quite rare to get a, a, a subunit command appointment as a captain in the military. So it's quite a big thing in the Remi. And I went into mine. Um, there was something called options for change. Oh, um, and, um, so, yeah, and, and a lot of the, po the workshops got downgraded from majors to captain's commands. And I happened to be in one, and I took mine, and I'd only been a captain four months, and so it's like this is yours. It was like a smash scrabble, like oh we haven't thought about this. Rob's taking this over, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it lots, but it was really hard work, and I had a difficult time with my artificer sergeant major, my S the W one, your right hand man, and and there's no you're the only officer there. There's no platoon commanders or emlets in, in my case, <coughs> and um, and basically I'd, I'd burnt out. I'd, I just was working flat out. I'd, I was sleeping in the office, going down to the mess, having a, a shower and breakfast, going back to the office sort of thing. Um, just because I didn't want to mess up for those 95 soldiers that I was in charge of. Um, so I went to the doctor and he, he said, Rob, and he said, basically, you're burnt out. You need to speak to somebody. So he, he got me to go and speak to a psychiatrist. Um, and I did. And then I started to realise that I wasn't looking after myself. And so that's how I knew I was depressed because I, I hadn't been out I hadn't, I hadn't socialized for about eight nine months and I remember going out after this and saying to somebody oh your hair's nice because some woman that, that I knew a friend of a friend she said when when did you change your hairstyle so it's been like this for six months I went what I haven't seen you for six months um so it's stuff like that and 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 the fact that just there was no pleasure in anything anymore everything was just a task it was just a chore going somewhere was a chore. I just had to pack my bag to go somewhere. It was a chore, even if it was a holiday or a break or something like that. So that was the first sign, but you didn't pay much attention to it in, at that age, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that style, uh, not age. You're but describing me at the moment. Jesus no, Christ. No, no. Go on. No. <laughs> Sorry, it's, yeah, it's a therapy <laughs> session for you now. We've swapped round. Um, but you, you just, you just and, and that probably ties into that article because I think one of the things I say is not looking after yourself. And... And so it's really important. And there's several things there uh, that I can connect that with, which I do in that article down the line. And so the first one was food, fizz, and sleep. And I learned that one um, in... So I, I've, I've ran what I dubbed to be the toughest, highest, and coldest foot races in the world. If they're not. It was just like a, a, a gimmick. But I ran the Marathon de Sarbs, the Everest Marathon, and the North Pole Marathon. Um, there is tougher, there is high, th there isn't higher, I know that for sure, um, but there is probably colder. Um, and um, 
and, and the North Pole one, I put as the cold one, is colder in the Yukon. But the North Pole one, I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to be on top of the world. So I went, oh, there's a marathon on top of the world. I'll <laughs> go there, um, which was awesome. But anyhow, so when I did the Marathon de Saabs, as you probably know, and quite a few people have done it, it's 155 miles across the desert, six days, carrying all your kit. And so you have to really prepare for it. And when you're preparing for that and you've got a job as well, even though that's a job in the military, which some people don't view as a real job, like my mother. Um, but, <laughs> but you don't have a real job, do you, Robert, like your sister? She's going to be watching. <laughs> Anyhow, so... Did she say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But mother, I'm in charge of 95 soldiers. <laughs> but your sister works very hard. My sister's going to kill me now. <laughs> but um, so, um, so you... you you b basically, I realised that I had to understand myself as a human being first, in what in order to do that amount of activity. And one of my favourite sayings, which is probably why I ended up as a simic officer, uh, is an Einstein saying, and it's peace can't be achieved by force; it can only be achieved by understanding. Which you can't, you can tell some, you can force somebody to put the weapon down, you can force somebody to do something, but they're going to go away and do it when their backs turned, your backs turned. So, I think I had to understand myself. And I had to understand what I was trying to achieve in the American disarmed concept. So I had to understand what I needed as a human being in order to do this a large amount of work. And it, it was as simple as the balance of food, physical activity and sleep. And if I didn't get that balance right, I was going to be messed up. And for everyone else, it can be different. But for me, it was that. So I often talk about him when I do presentations about, you know, I realised on the Marathon de Saabs, I'm only going to be running for 48 hours, but it's six days, so recovery is going to be quite key, and I'm going to have a lot of time to recover. So sleep's important. And so I thought, well, have a look at that and have, have a look how much I'm sleeping. And then you, it's loads of things that you look into. You look into sleep and you go, well, actually, you do the eight-hour sleep challenge. You challenge anyone to sleep seven to eight hours a night for, for a week and see if it makes a difference to them. And it, nine times out of ten, it will. There is some people who can survive on less sleep, and they're the Margaret Thatchers and Ronnie Reagans of the world, which is renowned to. Um, but those of those ended up with some form of dementia, so read into that as you will. Um, so you then go, so you get the sleep right, you get the balance right. Food, I realised if I ate the wrong foods, train at that level, it wasn't going to work. You know, you can eat a burger and have a pint, a pint of Guinness, a, 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 a several pints of Guinness every night but it's not going to work. You need to replenish yourself properly. And also, if I ate a full breakfast and, and whatever, it's going to make me feel slow and lethargic and I wasn't going to feel good about it. So food's important. And then and then fizz, balancing the fizz out. Just knowing, you know, I, I run every day for, for mental health reasons mainly, but then realising that you can't run 100 miles every day. You've got to balance out and so listen to your body. And so after you've, you know, sometimes, like this morning, I just jogged a mile just to loosen off. Um, so it's understanding that. So you get the balance of food, fizz, and sleep. But then that's also connected with not looking after yourself. And everyone's got an emotional regulation system. And as I understand it, your emotional regulation is, is driven by three things. You work because you're under threat, because you're driven. And you also work because you soothe. So you, you've soothed yourself. So we work because we're under threat, because... We've got a deadline at work. We've got um, something coming up because, or, or someone's challenging you for promotion or you want to be promoted at work or something. So, so that's a threat. And if you put that in a running context, if I'm in a running race when I was fit and young and somebody comes under my shoulder, on my shoulder in a race, I'm under threat. So I'm going to push myself to try and keep in front of them because I want to beat them. But we also work because we're driven. So we're driven because we want promotion at work. We're driven because we want to get a personal best in running. We're driven because we want to get the best out of ourselves. But that's, to me, a bank account. You know, you remember when in the military you talk about moral courage and it's a bank account and you have to replenish it every now and again. Well, to me, that bank account of threat and drive needs to be replenished with SUV. And so you have to look after yourself. And I wasn't, in the first respect, in, 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 to, in relation to that article, I just simply wasn't looking after myself. I was constantly going 100 miles an hour. I was either working in threat and drive and I wasn't soothing myself. And it sounds really soft and fluffy, but you've got to, you know, it, everyone needs to be out, have some form of loving or look at, looked after, but you've got to look after yourself first. And if you don't look after yourself, you're going to let people down, you're going to let yourself down. So that soothe can be 
sitting down and listening to a podcast, your favourite podcast with a cup of tea, making time to do that. What's your favourite podcast? Well, obviously it's H.R. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, generally, generally it is, actually. Um, well, yeah, because the Project Recce thing, he uh, said, what podcast do you like? And I, which will come on to Project Recce later. But I said, well, H.R. And so that's how I know, Neil yeah. got in touch with you. Yeah, how did that happen? <laughs> um, and um, Or Suv is you've had a particularly tough training session and then you're going, right, I need to do those stretching and probably have a bath and soak and and just take a chill pill sort of thing or read that book or, or something along those lines. So that soothe can replenish that threat and drive. And in the case of the suicide, I just wasn't looking after myself. I was just totally ignorant to that because I thought I was invincible. And a lot of people can be invincible, but every now and again, you just need to take that step off that foot off the accelerator and relax. Um, so that was the first thing that brought me to that. That point. It's a holistic like. approach, right? Yeah, isn't it? Um, it, it? When you talk about those three things, when if you know they, f so it sounds to me like they're your first thing you look at when you when you when you mental when you think I ain't operating at the optimum level at the moment. So you go back and look at food. You know, what was it food, fizz and sleep? Food, fizz and sleep. And you go yeah. right, and guaranteed one or all of those to be w well. One of those you live, you live lifted your foot off the gas on which yeah. impacts the other two which impacts the other two um and i think that's what people don't realize is it's a holistic approach you have to the, the basic the things that are most basic that you don't think really matter are the things that have the biggest impact there you go mm. food sleeping yeah food uh, food sleep and um fizz food food sorry food sleep and fizz yeah. Three of them. There's other stuff. There's external. There's external factors. But the, the, the key thing about the food, sleep, and fizz is, I preach it to you. I know, you can control those. Yeah. You have a direct impact on those. So one of the one of the one of, you mentioned about running for your mental health. That's one of the things I I I do, is if I. If I if I realize that I ain't good at the moment, then, it usually means all. Of those three things, I've left my foot off the gas. But the first thing I will do is I'll, if I can motivate myself to do it, I will go and do some physical activity, from paddleboarding to running to swimming, whatever. I'll just make myself go and do it. Yeah, make myself do it because the thing with physical activity is it is an immediate impact. Immediate. It's immediate. The minute you put one foot in front of the other, you start running. It's yeah. an immediate impact. You immediately feel better. Even yeah. if you, even if you start running ten steps later, you've still done something. Yeah. You're doing something positive, and it has a massive impact in your mind. Um, and that that's it. that's why I do fizz as the first thing to try and yeah. I, I it's tr it's to try and snap myself out. It's literally it's try and bump start my positive side of my mind back in. Give it a kickstart by going. By going to some physical activity because it's rapid. It's like you literally you will turn your mental state around in a matter yeah. of a matter of minutes. And then what that means is it's easier to make the right decisions. Yeah. Then it's easier to make a decision, like you said, take you know, let's let's make some adult decisions here and put some stuff aside, give yourself some downtime. Let's not eat shit. Let's cook a decent meal. You just you eat because your mind's in a better place. Yeah. From enacting change through physical activity, for example, in this example, then you just you make you yeah. it's easier to make the right decisions, yeah, and harder to make the wrong decisions. And when I run, I'm thinking, I'm, th I'm, th I'm thinking about. I come back. You always come back from a run or, or fizz or something. You say, oh, I thought about that, and he's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, I'm going to do this today, and suddenly you're reinvigorating. But it's also about tricking yourself as well because it's routine. Because if you're busy at work, you'll work late, and so your sleep's going to be affected, or you'll even wake up early and get into work early and that's going to affect your sleep but also then it's oh I haven't got time to do fizz and you hear it so many times and I, I appreciate that and I totally get that and I'm not, I'm not going to get on people for saying oh, I just haven't got time to do fizz but it's, it's making it part of your routine and it's sort of like, like my, fi my fizz is right go for a jog in the morning and it's not fizz it's just waking up um, but, but then because that's routine I've done it I've got it over with and now because I do it every day my family know I'm doing it every day. And so therefore, when, the, when there's a busy thing happening, like a wedding or a, something in the family, people actually say, Rob, you need to go for your run then. Okay, <laughs> sort of thing, because it's, they get used to it. 
and so people accept it and it's also it's about behaviors attitudes so my behavior is actually affecting people's attitude towards me it's also perception of workload yeah uh, one of the things one of the things i realized after the fact when, when it's actually when i left um you know you talk about sleeping in the office and, and working flat out uh is that you probably well you know now you could have worked 23 hours of that day and still after work think you have to work 23 hours on the next day the work doesn't get any less yeah it's the same if you work eight hours it doesn't matter how off how much you work there's going to be the same workload the next day some people get burnt out yeah because i think because the work is piling up so the point i'm making is if you just do your eight hours you know you do your nine to five whatever it is whatever your working hours are do your nine to five instead of your flipping 6 a.m until midnight the night, the workload, the next day is going to be the same if you do nine to five, or you do your six a.m. to midnight. Yeah. It's going to be the same. It's going to be the same. The trick is to prioritize what needs doing that morning, and everything else can wait. Yeah. It, it's like, I don't, it's a hard one to describe that. The perception that you've got so much on, you have to work constantly. It doesn't matter. You could work twenty four hours a day. Same amount of work yeah. is going to be there the next day. So yeah. just do your eight. Yeah. Do do what needs doing that day. Prioritize. Give yourself downtime because when you give yourself downtime again, preaching to the converted, you're more productive. Yeah. You're more productive. And having the reality that your inbox is never going to be empty. G- yes. Yeah, yeah, that's one of. The, and it, it's. And it's. I, I remember a good friend of mine in the army, um, an LE officer, um, said that was the biggest thing that he realised that he he would never his inbox would never be empty. And as soon as he got used to that, he went, yeah, life's become better. <laughs> um, but yeah really good bloke actually um so i think from from that i moved on and the the other thing that got me into that suicide position was cutting myself off because i know i'm autistic so i know i'm generally diagnosed as as asperger's um which is interesting that was another story but i remember saying to my mate a few years ago do you know they're making me do um autism tests and he went yeah i know you're autistic so how do you know that he says you're trying to you're trying to cut your ice cream into squares i went all right okay sorry (laughs) Um, and it was sort of like, yeah, but we still love you. I went, all right, thanks. Um, but um, I, I wanted to cut, my, I cut myself off. When it gets too much, I'm just isolating myself away from people because my attitude is I'm going down. I don't want anyone to go with me. And another thing I talk about in some presentations is the fact that to an extent, I don't want people to touch me. And, and I know there's a, an Asperger's thing there, but and that makes me understand you mean, it. You mean physically? Yeah, physically, yeah, yeah. But also, I just don't. I, I won't communicate with people. I won't tell people that my mind's thinking that right. So, for example, if I'm saying thinking, right, I'm, I'm going to do this podcast this morning, and then I, I'm going to then go and see my girlfriend and do X, Y, Z, and we're going to go to this restaurant. If I've not communicated that to my girlfriend, and she said, all right, I'm going shopping, and I go, no, but we're going to this restaurant, sort of thing. If I'm not communicated it, then that's going to create a problem because I'm going to get frustrated by it. But the thing about cutting me myself off, I'll give an example of uh, at my worst point, I could be in the kitchen preparing food or something and my, my ex-girlfriend would, would have walked past me and briefly touched me or brushed past me and I would go like that. So my my thought would have been going, oh, I, I um, froze then, I hope she didn't notice. She'd be going, why did he freeze? What's he done? What have I done? What have I done wrong? What's he done wrong? What's he doing? And so she that would have an effect on her and then when I get to that low point so that's driving a wedge because I'm not communicating and then when I get to that low point I've driven that wedge between my that that partner that important person in my life and suddenly that communication stopped and that wedge becomes bigger as, as I go more depressed and so that support network isn't there for me when I need it so it's about communicating as well but it's also about the anger of what it, or, but just wanting to cut myself off from other people so i recognize that now as a trigger do i want to cut myself off am i isolating myself am i avoiding that social event because i don't want to be in that social event and things along those lines so it's about recognizing those triggers um, and then when i've isolated myself actually i then become angry Be- which is stupid because oh, i haven't been invited to that social event and it's sort of like or i haven't or that person doesn't understand things, be, but I haven't talked to them. So that anger. So, so you get to that point of, well, what's the point? If I do die, nobody's going to bother. If I take my own life, nobody's going to care. Nobody, nobody want. No, nobody gives gives a crap about it. 
sort of thing. And so it's all about, it spirals out of control. So I suppose for me, with myself and depression, and I've got recurrent depression, so I know I have to spot these things. It's not something, because some people get depression and then get better. And they've, it's always going to be there, but they're, they're better and they know how to manage it. With me, a low mood can turn into a depressive state quite quickly. And when I get to those stages, that's a phone call to a crisis line or, or the NHS or, 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 or a psychiatrist or, or um, a specialist at some point. Um, and and so, I, yeah, basically, it, it's the triggers I need to spot. So what that paper was trying to do was trying to say, these are the triggers that I look out for. So it was like not looking after myself, cutting myself off from people, and then becoming angry about things. Um, and because you're angry and because you've isolated yourself, you've lost pride and you've lost that confidence. And, you know, when we look, when anyone, I think, looks back on their lives and they think, I wish I had that confidence I had when I was in my 20s, when I was going through basic training. You know, when you finish basic training, you were invincible. You thought you, for me personally, thought I was invincible. I was going to change the world. Brilliant, I'm here now. And then suddenly that gets worn down by life <laughs> and you, you suddenly get to your 40s and you're going, what's happened to that person? Where's that person gone? And so in a way I'm looking back and I'm going, I've lost that pride. I've lost that that confidence in myself. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I I'm totally on board with the the triggers. I I I call them. What do you call them triggers? KPIs really. Um, for me, it's yeah. uh, one of the key ones is indecision. So, not wanting to dis- make a decision about a basic thing. Oh yeah. Oh god. Yeah. So if I realise, oh my god, what, from when I say decision, it could be, you know, having to make a decision to respond to an email at work, for example. It could be, um, what my ex-wife saying, uh, "Do you want to have the kids on this day?" You know. Uh, it could be my girlfriend asking me something. It could be anything like that. Basic stuff, which I shouldn't. And if I have indecision. I basically hide it away. I, 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 I ignore the email. I don't respond to the WhatsApp message of Blumber. That, for me, is the main one. I, when, which, when I realize I'm doing it, I go, Fuck, something's not right here. Like, generally, my mental state said, something's not right. What else are you talking about there? Um, the confidence one. Really interesting. I was, uh, that's a really, that's, I think that's really, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, common. I think with people who are um, not operating at the men, I, I don't like to say mentally ill, not operating at the optimal level mentally, right? Yeah, um, is a confidence one, and it's something that I I I only realised it literally week last last week when I was at home, went back to my parents in South Wales, and for a long time, for like years, I used to play for the rugby club there, and they play rugby every Saturday, and for a long time, I would not go out and watch the rugby if it was on because I, w- I because of my self-confidence I felt I didn't feel confident going out and being around the people who I'd known yeah. growing up there being asked questions being engaged in conversation this is something I hadn't realised I was not feeling confident about until last week when I after I'd gone out stood there watched a match and I come back in and I thought I would not have done that six yeah. months ago why have I done that now why have I just gone out there with not care in the world, watched yeah. a match, had a conversation with people, come back in? What has, what has changed? And it's I think it's just because over the last few years, generally, not being in a good way, yeah. and uh, and now I'm in a better way. And it's that, uh, and it's a lack of self-confidence that I hadn't realised, yeah. you know, that I, I'm, I'm generally a super confident guy. I didn't grow up like that, but now I'm a super confident guy. And that those little things, like, why the fuck wouldn't I go out and watch a rugby match? What yeah. am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? You know, people I know. That's again, like another indicator. It's really interesting you said that. Yeah, I had, again, a recent revelation for me. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's connect- physical and mental health is massively connected. And it's not... It's the same thing. I, uh, yeah, well, I, and I think we should stop saying physical and mental health. Yeah. We should say physical fitness, mental fitness. We talk about physical fitness. We need to talk about mental fitness. And yeah. I know people like... Lots of people talk about it, and particularly in the in the army now, they talk about that men- having the right mental fitness. And... To me, last year, I was probably at one of my physical peaks over the, since being out of the army, and I was in such a good way. Um, and I remember I, I got out on my push bike, and I just remember thinking, oh, I'm in a good place now, and, and I was about to finish my therapy with 
a complex treatment service. So effectively, I've been in therapy since 2012 to 2020 because I'd, I'd left the military and then I flicked over to the NHS and Op Courage or complex treatment services, Op Courage as it is now, it, it, it basically said, well, we think you're ready to move on. You're not, you're not fixed. You're never going to be fixed, but you've got the right tools. And I was a bit unsure about it. And I remember being on the bike and thinking, this is brilliant. And I'd just got the bike fixed up because I'd done Land's End John O'Groats on it yeah, for several years ago. And I'd saved loads of money, uh, for, not loads of money, I'd saved a little bit of money from lockdown and not traveling. And I thought, I'll just, rather than get it go to waste, I'll just fix it up. And I got it fixed up and it was the first ride on it. And I, 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 I fell off and broke my neck. Um, and so, <laughs> so, so it's not like, like a Shenton's <laughs> world's just full of disappointing <laughs> things. Um, I think because my physical fitness was there and my mental fitness was in such a state, that got me into a position where I could say, yeah, I can cope with this. And yeah, it's been a hard, hard journey, you know, lots of tears, lots of um, collar on for eight weeks, uh, metal work now in my neck and, you know, and, and being really worried that I couldn't run. And, and you know, that was my first thought, when can I run? When, when can I run again? because that's my mental health and I, I don't want to have to take medication again. There's nothing wrong with taking medication, but for me it wasn't working and we found another way around. Um, and um, yeah, basically um, the, the, the three things saved my life that day was a good cycle helmet, the NHS and my fitness, and I mean men mental and physical. Um, but actually getting to where I am now, which is just a year down the line, it's been, it's been quite people say oh it's been incredible but I'm just like well no that's, that's just the state I was in that's just because I had the right attitude and because my physical fitness was there but because your physical fitness has such um, has such an effect on how you mentally feel because you feel confident in yourself you feel confident you can run and things I'm, I'm in an athletics club I'm not going to be the next Mo Farah I'm not but I run in a master's league so I'm always going to be at the back of the pack but it's just that moment where suddenly everything's spring fitting together whether it and you're saying yeah, actually I've got this that's a good run I can do this and and the fit and my my fiance says when I go and do veterans athletics or me, me, it's called masters it's not veterans in terms of army veterans um it's masters in terms of age when I come back after a run she says you're smiling and you don't realize until she said that I am I mean, I'm petrified before. It's only a 1,500 meter run, but it's it's all light, um, which is nothing compared to the ultra marathons that I've done. But it's it's just that that relief, and then thinking, yeah, I've got it. And and I also, I mean, this is me waxing lyrical, but I also think running around a track is quite dull, which it is. And actually, it's a mental battle because if you're pushing yourself to a physical state. Is you know, after after the the, sh the the starting pistol's gone off, I really want to step off that track and give up. But if I've battled through that and I've got round to the end, even if I've come last, I've go I've won that battle. And so me so I won't step off the track because I don't want to lose that battle. And and it's a it's a win for me even if I come last. Yeah, I could, I could speak. I could watch lyrical about the benefits of physical fitness. Um, I'm not fit, but I'm fitter than I can when I was. Well, there's, there's an aspect there you touched on, which is putting yourself out of your comfort zone, comfort zone and doing something you don't want to do Yeah. as well as part of that, uh, apart from the physical side of it. And uh, com a complete surprise to me, I have I started, like I, compared to what I was thinking last year, I started cold showering last week. Like oh, yeah. Every day. Uh, last week? What day are we on? No, this week. This week. And uh, I've been resisting that. for uh, One, because it's like, oh, everyone's on about, oh, yeah. What? Fucking cold showering and uh, cold water therapy and all this just breaks me. Oh god, just stop going banging on about it. Um, well, I've got a really good mate called Steve, uh, and he does it every morning. He does it for mental health reasons. Uh, and I did it two weeks ago. I, I was fanny with it though. I got <laughs> in. I put the shower on. I put the shower on warm. Right. So I got in. Yeah. <laughs> I got in on. I got it on warm, and I got in like having a shower. And then I gradually I turned it down, temperature down a little bit, so it got a little bit less warm, a little bit less warm. Just gradually, I like eased myself into the cold side, and then uh, I whacked it on the cold, and uh, so it wasn't that much of an impact. But I, I, that first time I did it, I, I, it, I was like giddy in the shower. I was laughing. I was just like it just had a mental mental impact on me. I was laughing in the shower. I was laughing the, at the at the the like 
how preposterous it was. I was having a cold shower. I was like, why the fuck am I, why am I doing this? I was literally laughing, out loud laughing on my own in the shower. And then uh, stopped that, and that was like the week before. And I got out, and I thought, flipping heck. That was, that's, that reaction was mental. And I think, why did I have that reaction? Because I'd done something I didn't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> but also, why am I having a fucking cold shower? It's weird. Anyway, so then last week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I cold showered every day. But I got in. I put the shower on cold before yeah. I got in. It was on cold. And I, I remember the first day I got I was I just stood. My shower's like in a bath, right? Yeah. I'm stood in the bath looking at the water. I put my hand yeah. in. <laughs> it was freezing cold. And I'm going, oh, no. What am I doing? Put my hand here. I had to properly okay. psych myself up. I did some breathing exercises that I'd heard on a, on a video. I was like, like breathing exercises to calm myself down. Yeah. Not to psych myself up, to calm myself down. And um, like three or four short breaths in and then a long breath out to calm myself down. I just walked in and it was horrendous. It was, I hated it. But then I got used to it. I got out and I was so happy with myself. I was chuffed. I washed, you know, showered in a lot. It was completely yeah. cold. I was in it for five, six minutes, right? Completely cold, freezing. But I got out and I was happy with my, I was so happy because I, it, it's like, never mind the cold water therapy. I don't, like heat therapy, heat shock therapy, I understand it. I go in a sauna for 20 minutes. I do that for the heat shock therapy. I understand it because it works both ways, cold and hot. But with the cold shower, I was happy. I had achieved something. I was like, I'd done something I didn't want to do. I didn't want to do it. And it's positive. It can only be a positive impact, right? It's what, I didn't do something I didn't want to do, and it's a negative thing. Like, I didn't chop my finger off and go, yes, I did something I didn't want to <laughs> do. Oh, I, got, I got the shower, cold shower. I got, I've done something I didn't want to do there. I've challenged myself. I've overcome the, the feeling of not wanting to do yeah. it. So I, to me, that's like, yes, it gives me value. Like, I'm valuable to myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it adds to the self-confidence thing. It's one of the reasons I go, I go and do boxing. I do that. Majority of the reason I do that is for self-confidence. Not because I want to go and fill people in, but because doing that gives me more self confidence, yeah. and I'm just happy going up the day. I cold showered Tuesday, I cold showered Wednesday, I cold showered Thursday, every day, and I didn't do it Friday because I was at my missus's place. She ain't got a shower. Right? I'm not getting a cold bath. It's not. Are you not? It's not happening. It's not happening. Are you not going to get one of these uh, like um, Don't wheelie bins? No, you can fuck off. You're not going to do no, that. No. 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 I say that now. I, last year I was saying I love a cold shower on the half now, but there we go. But, so, um, it's, I think it's it, better if you plunge. Yeah. I mean, I can't. I, str- I do try cold showering, but I think it's better of a plunge in, and just get it over with. But the thing is, I try. <laughs> Don't laugh. So when I <laughs> when I had my neck when I broke. <laughs> When, when I was recovering from my broken neck, I thought, well, here's a chance because normally I live in Hampshire with my fiance and she doesn't have a garden, but I am, I've still got my place up in the Midlands and I've got a garden. So I thought, excellent, we're stuck up there because that's where I broke my neck and I'm getting all the medical treatment. I thought, tell you what, I can get a wheelie bin, fill it with cold water and ice and have that there. But the problem was I couldn't get out. Oh. <laughs> so, so I tried it. I got the wheelie. I got a clean wheelie bin after the bin made a bin, and I put myself in, and I just couldn't leave myself out because of my neck. Oh. And so, so, so I thought, yeah, probably give that a few weeks. Um, I did do a plunge pool. I was at a, I was at um, a gym in London, near Morgate it was, and they. I, I came out the sauna. I was at lunch break at work. I came out the sauna, and they had a plunge pool. I was like, God, right, let's go and give this flipping. Never tried. This is year before last. Got in, lowered. I thought I'm going to go in. I'm going to do 30 seconds. That's all I'm going to do. Just lower myself down the ladder. It's only a small. I mean, literally, maybe a little bit bigger than the wheelie bin. Tiny thing. Freezing cold, mate. Lowered myself in. Got all the way in. Did 30. I counted to 30. Did 30 seconds. I got out. Oh my god, the pain. <laughs> the pain. I I was. The pain was excruciating in my whole body. Yeah. I was in tatters. Absolute, but you know what I think it was looking thinking back is because I got out of that plunge pool and I was in a warm environment. Yeah. I was like out, I, I was out the sauna, right? But in the the, the the room, the small room where the plunge pool was, it was warm. So I th- and obviously, and I wasn't used to it either. I've done cold water, I've done cold water dips three times this year since. One with a mate who who does it. He listens to the podcast actually. Shout out to Tom Gray. He goes every morning, gets in, the, in a river in Swansea. Yeah. For mental health. He goes down, he does it, he gets in. I mean, freezing cold. He goes, he just gets in his box of shorts, right? Oh, he's got wetsuit gloves and wetsuit shoes mm-hmm. to keep his extremities warm. But everything else, he just gets in, dips his head under. I did it with him um, a couple of months back. Because 
I only did it because I know he would have he would have liked it for me going to do it with him. He's going to do yeah. something with him. But then I, I do you know what? It's probably that led me onto the flipping cold showers actually. But yeah, we went and got into the in the river, um, and I enjoyed it when I got out. Oh yeah, <laughs> because again, it's that doing something I didn't want to do, overcoming adversity. That's one thing. Doing something I didn't want to do, challenging myself, and you can do that really really easily every day. But really you're al- you're also controlling your mind aren't you? So your mind doesn't want to do it. And when you get in, you're saying, I need to get out, I need to get out. And you're controlling it. And there's um, there's a chap called Professor Mike Tipton who does a lot on cold water immersion. He's based on uh, Portsmouth University. He's a great bloke, um, Ironman triathlete sort of person. And I, I came across him when I was training to go to the North Pole. So my attitude of peace can't be achieved by force. It can only be achieved by understanding every time I did an event, I wanted to do everything about that event to reduce the amount of stress I'd be suffering in the event. So, for example, Marathon de Saabs, I knew I had to run 50 miles, so I had to find a 50-mile event that I could run. I knew I'd be running in at heat in, 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 in high temperatures, so I found a heat chamber that I could go and run in. And so, so by the time I got to the event, I'm going, well, I know I can run in a heat chamber, I know I can run at this heat, I know I can run the distance, I know I can run multi-day events, so I've got less stress. So, and uh, I do that with every event. So North Pole Marathon, right? It's a marathon. I know I can run a marathon, but I need to know if I can run at those low temperatures, and I need to test my kit out as well because it gives you a chance to test your kit. So there was um, a climatic chamber in Portsmouth, and uh, quite a few people have used it. Jordan Wiley's used it for it, the stuff that he was doing as well, and um, Mike Tipton runs it. It's the Renault Fines clima- climatic chamber. So I was quite honoured to go in it. And he set his treadmill up and he got it down down to minus 26 and I went in and tested the kit. But he's a big fan of cold water immersion. He does a lot with the RNLI because um, when people fall into the sea or into water, the first thing is they panic and the panic can then induce drowning. And that's where he came up with the... He, I think he is the person that came up with the lie on your back. Relax sort of thing. Go on, explain that. So if you, if you end up um, in a situation where... I don't know. You've you've dropped into a cold, a colder, wet, wet environment or colder water environment. I suppose a lot of the time, uh, I understand that the panic you're wasting energy because you're trying to panic and get out of the water or get warm or something like that. And he says, or, or the, the the guidance is, and I think if you look on any Coast Guard agency website, it says when you get in the water, relax, lie on your back, float, and you will float naturally. Um, And, you know, when you do triathlon, you get into trouble, you go on your back because your body floats. Um, Top tip, don't do triathlon back float uh, on on, on your back backstroke because the safety boats will come and save you. Um, But um, (laughs) they, um, which I found out to my parents. Imagine seeing someone backstroke in a triathlon. You're like, what are you doing? Yeah, Yeah, I I could tell you funny stories about that. (laughs) But um, so, so yeah, lie on your back. And and, uh, it's because you're calming down you're gaining control of your body. And I suppose, and it's your mind doing that, controlling it. And so there's probably an aspect, I assume, of getting into the cold water theory where your mind's controlling it. So you're calming your body down and you're calming your responses down, which actually with anxiety, it's your body, escalate, your mind escalating those things in your body. And so I suppose if you can then apply those techniques that you are going from the cold water therapy to life when you're getting into those situations, like, right, calm down, what do I need to do? And that's why I talk about the soothe because that is about calming down and taking things from there. But um, yeah, so and I think the other thing that you've we've latched on is purpose because it's about identity. And you've undoubtedly got a purpose here with your podcast and you've got a purpose with what you do with your boxing and what you do with the rugby and, th- and things along those lines. And that's helping you form your identity. And I think veterans, personally, I think veterans struggle with that because you lose your identity when you lo- when you step out of uniform. You lose part of your identity when you step out of uniform. But we've, on, we've only got a couple of minutes left, right? Sorry. But that's interesting. <sighs> Sense of purpose is a big one. Mm. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, but what you can't do, you cannot artificially assign yourself a sense of purpose no not at all um, which 
this is not a podcast came about. I tried to do it the podcast, which yeah. absolutely one of the things. And, I, and the million other things I'm involved with, try to artificially assign myself a sense of purpose because I felt zero value in, in my life. Zero value. Um, which is connected with your comp- confidence and your pride and everything. Yeah. But again, going back to that holistic, yeah. I felt zero value in my life. I tried to ar- artificially, artificially assign myself a sense of purpose. And the ex-military and other people from certain backgrounds and stuff, they experience that... No one ever ex- is. No one ever experiences gaining a sense of purpose. I don't think no, they just no, don't. It happens. It, really, it, 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 like intrinsically, they don't. But there are people, as obviously, that experience a loss of a sense of purpose that we never really knew we had until we lost it, and then you try and regain it artificially. Military, you try and find an organisation, you try and sign back up, you try and get involved with a rugby club, a fucking podcast, whatever. You try and give yourself a sense of puts back, but you can't do it. With me, what changed, which we've talked about, what 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 changed it for me was, which stopped the question, which stopped me asking the question of why am I here, why do I exist, which stopped me uh, accusing myself of being of zero value to people, as you've experienced, you talked about. What stopped that? was demonstrating value to myself, challenging myself, overcoming adversity, um, doing doing the right things when I sh- w- that should be done on a daily basis, and I started off with the real basic building blocks. Mm. When I was at the lowest ebbs of where I was, the you know, the, the fucking depths, man. You know, not not washing repeatedly, not brushing my teeth, not. It, it, not keeping the house in order, not cleaning after myself, yeah. all that stuff, you know, that is just, uh, or the, 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 the end, it's the end of life stuff. It's end of life. You, you, you acting like it's the end of your life. Nothing yeah. matters anymore. You yeah. don't care about anything. Yeah. And, 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 and what I, what I started doing was, um, I've spoken about this before. So apologies to people who've uh, been talking about this before. What I started doing was I would set myself a mission every day. So I, I literally the training point was I said right tomorrow morning again I'm gonna brush my teeth straight away when I get yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, totally I got up next morning. Yeah. I brushed my teeth straight away when I got up. Yeah. The impact that had on me was the same as getting in a cold water shower. I'd achieved something, you know. But but that impact was of uh, an order of magnitude greater because I had no value to myself whatsoever at that time. Yeah. I was achieving in my eyes. I was achieving nothing. Yeah. There was no reason to be there. No one cared about me. I didn't care about anyone else. I didn't care about being here. And by getting up and brushing my teeth, one, I'd brush my teeth, which is good. Two, I'd done what I set out to do. I'd achieved something. So that means, that meant to me, internally, subconsciously, I was, there was a value to me. Yeah. I set myself another mission, and I, I, I carried on brushing my teeth every day, obviously. I set myself another mission that for the next day, which was different, something really small, and I achieved that. And every day it went on, the value in, within, I felt more valuable. Uh, subconsciously, yeah. I felt more valuable, and the the question of what's my sense of purpose, why am I here, what is what is the point of me being on this planet? It wasn't that I found the answer. Yeah. It was that I stopped asking the question. Yeah. The question it doesn't exist to me anymore. It doesn't exist to me anymore. I don't have that question. This happened last time. Well, up again. Jesus Christ. Sorry. I'm sorry. For, no, I no. thought I would end up like no, that. No. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, because when I talk about this, I remember. Yeah. I remember um, what it felt like not having, oh, Jesus of God, not having that, feeling that, um, uh, inva- uh, not invaluable, invaluable is the wrong word, feeling, feeling that worthless. But I hate it, I hate it. And, and, and knowing now, going back, how, how long I felt like that, and it was so easy, when I got out of it, it was so easy to get out of it, it was so easy to get out of it, but yeah. yet I went through that feeling for so long, I didn't need to go through all that. Yeah. I, if I'd just known earlier. You know, it's like, man. It's exactly, I mean, what you talked about, waking up, cleaning your teeth, that sort of thing. I always say, have a plan. And and I'm not talking about a big master plan, like I'm going to take over the world and become prime minister or something like that. But it's it's um, it's um about having a plan. Like, today's been shit, excuse my language, but I will, tomorrow, it's going to be better. And I'm going to wake up and I'm going to clean my teeth. And then I'm going to get dressed. Because I've had mornings where... I, it takes me two hours to get my socks on because I just can't be bothered. And what's the point? And um, and it's about... Is, and then you say, right, next morning, here's my plan. And then you build on that plan. And so you've had a whole week of cleaning your teeth. You've had a whole week of being able to get dressed and not lounging around the house. But actually, then I'm going to do this and this and this. And that builds on. 
Um, but the purpose, it, ca it, it gets you, y you don't go out finding a purpose, I totally agree, but it's, it will, it suddenly develops in you. Like for example, I've, I'm big into my running. I'm not a brilliant runner, but I enjoy my running and, you know, to an element of help for heroes has helped me with that because, um, of the Invictus games. I wasn't an Invictus athlete. I haven't, I, I tried going for selection for Invictus, but failed and which, which, <coughs> But I carried on with the athletics club because I thought there's something here I like this. And now in that athletics club, I'm a mental health champion in the athletics club. I'm, you know, I I am. Um, I, so I've set that up, and I'm also involved in other. Where is it? Like last week, I was helping paint the hut in the athletics club and things like that. Um, but that's suddenly developing into a purpose. That's starting to shape me as an individual because I am, that left club is part of me and I'm part of that and I've got that role to play there now as well. And so it develops and I think when we leave the military, a lot of people who are pure, 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 pure military, suddenly they haven't got anything and it's about having something to eat to transition into. Um, but yeah, I totally, I totally get it in terms of the plan. And I think, well, I know we're running out of time, but I would also say one of the final things I always talk about is have a fallback plan. And, and this is the thing that, that saved my life. And so there's, there's loads of charities which has helped me, which I know I know it's meant to be here to talk about, but um, you know, help, help for Heroes has helped me. I'm an ambassador for Help for Heroes. Love them or hate them, they do a good job. And actually, if they weren't there, the world would be a worse place for many people. Well, me included. They yeah. Help me, they help me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Project Recce, um, construction charity, uh, a charity which or soon it is now a charity which helps get veterans into construction. And if you think about it, right, I'm not in the construction industry. My brother is a builder, is a builder. But when you think about it, the sort of things that we had in the army in terms of banter and teamwork and camaraderie is there in the construction industry. And you're sort of like, fellas, this is a no brainer. If you, if you like being outdoors and you like the teamwork and you like the banter, there's something already here, which is similar. Um, and there's stuff like that. And like, Talk about purpose. I'm in the Invictus Games choir. Can't sing. Thought I couldn't sing. But my God, the times that I've been on stage and singing as a choir will get me emotional. And I don't cry. I do, well, I do. I get emotional. I get upset. But I remember being on stage at Sheffield for the Invictus Games trials as part of the Help for Heroes Invictus Games choir. And I remember I'm in the bass line, believe it or not. And, um, and they're all big, big rugby player type similar to yourself um in um and the bass line and i remember the girls were singing something and it was just really nice and i remember looking to my left and thinking i'm feeling i'm well enough here a bit i can't do this <laughs> oh deep breaths Ooh. and i looked to my left and every single one of them's crying no every way. single one of the bass line and i'm sort of like right okay and I, I we sang at salisbury cathedral a few years ago and I came off the stage and I had tears coming down my cheeks. I was going, what's going on? And it's just that camaraderie and that thing. And it's about, it's about that purpose. That's part of my life now. But sorry, I've got on but fallback plan. The thing that saved my life genuinely from being in that suicide position. So I took myself into a wood in West Sussex and um, I had a, a tape rope in my bag and I knew there was a tree that had fallen. And I knew I could get onto a higher tree branch because it fallen against a tree. And I knew I could tie a rope up there. And I knew that that's where I could end it all. And um, basically, I ended up, when I did the marathon de Sabs, I knew I'd wobble on a marathon. I always wobbled at 17 miles on a marathon. I thought, I'm going to have a wobble at 155 mile race. Yeah, mental. Yeah, just like, sort of like, I haven't got confidence yeah, to do yeah. this. Which is stupid on a marathon because 17 miles, you've only got nine miles left. You're sort of like, what have you done? Um, and so... I always knew I had a wobble. I have wobbles when I were in tear. It's always at 50 minutes. Every time I go, I'm down in my navigation, I look at my watch, 45 to 50 minutes. Right, okay, just carry on. You know you're right. Um, officer with a map, read into that later. But um, so I knew I'd have this wobble. And I spoke to somebody and he gave me the idea. And I wrote to every single one of my friends and I said, give me one reason why I'm going to succeed at this. And they wrote back to me and it was all military mates like because you're an idiot because you're the only person I know who can do it because you're stubborn <laughs> because you, because we look, we know you'll do it and it was all good stuff so I printed it off as small as possible because type 8 is lighter than type 9 font type 10 font 
folded it in. You're serious, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I weighed everything. I even knew that PG Tips tea bags were the lightest tea bags to take with me. That's how autistic I was. Um, because you have to carry the weight with you. And um, which is, you know, ex soldier, oh, I don't want to carry 12 kilograms. What? <laughs> so I don't want to carry a time yeah. nine font. I'll carry yeah. type eight, yeah. And so I put it next to a tea bag and I thought, if it goes wrong, I'm going to sit down, make a brew, and while the water's boiling, I'm going to read that note. And I took that note and. Um, I didn't use the note, but I used the tea bag. That's another story. Um, and I put that note in my wallet at the end of the day, at the end of the event, and I forgot about it after I packed my stuff away. And uh, I was in the woods in West Sussex, and I had the rope around my neck, and I went, right, this is it. Um, and I remembered I had the note, and I thought, I'll just read it. And I hadn't read it really since that day, um, a few years ago, and so, oh, since I put it together. So I opened the note, and it changed my life. And I just, well, no, not, not spiritually, but I went, right, I need to sort this out. Because it made me realise that there was people there that cared for me. And it made me realise that, you know, despite getting to that point of being angry and hating people and wanting to do myself in because it would make them suffer because they're all gits and they don't care. And they'll, 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 they'll you know, is there that anger in me? It made me realise that there was people there that did care. And so I packed the stuff up, took the rope down, walked out of the woods and it ended up in um, uh, Basingstoke Mental Hospital two days later. Um, and that saved my life. So fallback plan. Always have a fallback plan. Because uh, planning is important. Routine is important. You can dip yourself out of things through routine. But just have that fallback plan because it could save your life. And now I have notes in my wallet from my fiancé. Um, and I've got a note by my bed just in case. And I still have dips. And I still have bad times. But they're never going to be that bad. And when I broke my neck... Um, everyone was saying, look, this is really good how well you've su survived this and how well you've progressed. And next week I'm running an, an athletics championship. So I'm going to come last, but it doesn't matter. Um, and they're saying, this is amazing. Um, and I'm sort of like, yeah, but actually this injury you can see because I had a collar on. And actually the worst it I've ever been is when I was in that wood in West Sussex. And that was an injury people couldn't see. So that was the lowest point of my life. And I'm never going to get lower. So even breaking my neck wasn't going to go back to that point. So it just gave me, it spurred me on. So have a fallback plan. That's always my biggest message, really. Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Um, we need to wrap it up. Project Recce, how do people find that? I know we, we, we that's a, you're absolutely right. Construction industry is very, very similar for some people who are trying to get into something that is not blue light services, but similar to the military. Absolutely, construction industry. For me, it's farming and construction. Two yeah, other yeah, things. Yeah. So, Project Recce, what's the, you've got the website? Uh, yeah, they've got a website. You're going to have to Google them. Go, just Google Project Recce there Construction, you you'll find it. Uh, Neil and Loz and uh, Sue and a few of us run it. Uh, Neil is a construction industry, Loz is a, 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 an ex infantry officer. Um, and then there's Sue who sort of like coordinates everything. And they're doing really well. They've, they're have they just about to get on to get charity status. So they've started out as a CIC getting charity status. They've got um, Armed Forces Covenant funding. And it's really good. You you see the they, they put on courses for people who are interested in, veterans who are interested in construction industry and those people transitioning out of the military. And then you see them down the line going you know they'll pop up in other courses and give their success stories or whatever and you just see how they've changed and thought you know they've gone through this bit in the military leaving the military being worried and they're suddenly finding part of their purpose and identity again but they didn't just do that and the reason why i got involved in them is um i'd spoke to them a few times and chatted with them because i thought they were, you just spotted them as a good organization and when i broke my neck they said do you want to do a comedy course like, what um, my life's a comedy as it is. Uh, and so um, they offered me, um, or they did an online comedy course over lockdown to keep people engaged. Um, and they now do project comedy as well. <laughs> which is about getting people on, I mean, for after lockdown, getting people on stage doing open mic nights. But that was really good, and it really cheered me up, particularly when I was in, just got out of collar. But they're, they're such a good um, organisation. I totally promote them uh, in terms of just look them up. Yeah. Project Recce. Project Recce. Quality. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, people can connect, connect with you on LinkedIn, can't they? You on any other social media? Yeah, yeah. I think on LinkedIn I'm known as Robert Shenton because that's what my mother calls Robert. me. Robert. Uh, but you'll find me on Twitter as uh, Running MDS Rob. Um, and if you Google me, um, uh, runningrob.com is my website. But I, I'm not selling anything. I just put that website up and kept it going to okay. talk about running and mental health. Okay. Mate, cool. 
been a quality conversation. Really Brilliant. enjoyed it. Yeah, so have I. Thanks very much. Let's, uh, let's go see the rugby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>